Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today at the University of Arizona, um, and in particular for our Tech Law Day. Um, we are really lucky to have uh, with us today Kate Klonick. Kate is an assistant professor of law at St. John's University in New York, and she is among the world's leading experts in so many things, content moderation, thinking through the power of private platforms to shape our speech ecosystem. She's also got a really interesting and longstanding research agenda in IP property, social norms, shaming, robotics, AI, internet law more generally. I first met Kate a few years ago when I was on the hiring committee at my old school and I we interviewed Kate and I was really impressed at the time. And I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Kate, but there, you know, there's this form that law schools have to, law school, folks who want to become law professors have to fill out this form to say, this is who I am and this is what I teach. And so you can click a sort of pre-populated set of subjects, like I'm a torts person or I'm a criminal law person. And then there's this kludgy, awkward category called computer law. Is that right? Or is it computers and law? It's and computers and law. It's not even like it's, it, even like, worse. it's not even modifying it. It's like something separate. <laughs> so anyway, given all of the things I just described Kate as being expert in, I actually think it's fair description that Kate is an expert in computers and law. Um, and in fact, Kate is one of the stars, rising stars in the growing field of computers and law. Kate is also a first rate journalist who has done some really interesting work for The New Yorker. Check out her piece just last week about this so-called Supreme Court of Facebook. And she's got a killer Twitter feed where you can learn about cutting edge technology issues and also um, her amazing ability to grow tomatoes. Okay, so uh, welcome Kate. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I, this um, is wonderful. No one's ever bothered to mention my incredible ability to grow tomatoes before. I, I, I follow me. you on Twitter and I'm like, look at those tomatoes. I mean, it's unbelievable. You, you, you make tomato. I follow her on Twitter too. I don't remember anything about tomatoes, but I do remember various antics between you and uh, family members and dogs. So yes, that is no matter what true. your interest is, <laughs> it will cater to it. <laughs> So the plan for I, I look as a as a as a, a person who, who likes to eat maybe too much, I would love to spend an hour talking about tomatoes, but I think we should use the time to talk about um, cutting edge technology issues and and Jane and Kate and I talked about um, ways of trying to understand what's happening in the past year. Um, there's too much that's happened to try to capture it all succinctly, but I think um, it might be helpful if we started by talking about what's happened recently in Australia and the Facebook struggles with the Australian government and, and see if we can sort of um, discern some patterns from that experience. Does that make sense? So Kate, do you want to, do you want to kick us off with a description of what's happening and, um, yeah. and we'll go from there? I, I hope that my, I have not, and this is one of those things where I have not had as much, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor to talk to both of you. Um, I have missed seeing both of you at conferences and panels. It's like one of the best parts about our particular discipline is I think that the people who do it are really awesome and fun, and I actually like hanging out with them, so it's a bummer that we're not all together. Um, but this is a great uh, substitute, especially in the wake of the uh, the um, Facebook v Australia kind of moment that we just all lived through. Um, that was uh, basically, um, please correct me if I get any of these facts wrong or slightly wrong, because they are like kind of coming to me as filtered through US media outlets and sometimes they're not incredibly precise. Um, but my understanding is that basically Australia um, plan to pass legislation that was going to have major platforms pay a portion of their revenue to um, news organizations proportionate to the number of stories that people linked to outside news media um, on those platforms. And that basically uh, when they announced this, uh, Facebook, Google uh, had been colluding or talking to or bargaining with or lobbying with um, the Australian government in smoke filled rooms for some time kind of figuring out a way to kind of get to a happy place on what this was going to be. Uh, and Facebook had decided to kind of take their football and go home, uh, which is so to speak, which is basically they decided that they announced that they were going to turn off um, news links uh, and the sharing of news links and news pages uh, in Australia through geo blocking. 
um, and, uh, and only on Facebook because it's Facebook. But this caused kind of this interesting, I, I think that Casey Newton in my Twitter feed called it like watching everyone in his Twitter feed turn into human pretzels because it was like a lot, all of this kind of conversation around like how can Facebook take away this like this public service of providing news to people at this moment that we're all in a pandemic and so reliant on like on like on this kind of like this thing how powerful are they how can they do this this was terrible and then also people being like this is a story of how why Facebook needs to be regulated and of course it was like a story of how they were avoiding that and then it was just it was like all of these kind of mixed intuitions um and uh kind of I would say kind of uh, very a moment of real like kind of transnational conversation where people were coming all with their own priors from their exact kind of disciplines and their exact countries into kind of this this ecosystem and what had happened but what I will say is kind of what emerged from all of this I would say undisputedly is that you saw basically it was on display in a way that have for those of us who've been studying it for a long time, we have known that that type of power existed, that those types of smoke-filled rooms were happening, that Google and Facebook were having those types of conversations with the EU, uh, right to be forgotten, the GDPR, whatever it might be, um, and you know, or Thailand or Pakistan or any type of place that tried to like kind of like conscript how the content that the, the content that was going to be hosted on the platforms um, and that we have I, I mean Jane and definitely Andrew like your work has talked about this for some time um, that these were kind of things that have been um, have been like ruminating and I think for for whatever reason this moment in Australia just kind of captured people's attention and showcased exactly how strong these powers are and how much they are fulfilling private and public functions as we traditionally define them. Although I think that some of those discernments are collapsing. And so what I kind of wanted to kind of end with was at the end of the day, uh, Facebook gave in, like Facebook and uh, Facebook or, or the Australian government gave in. It's really like what your, what your perspective is. Um, and they reached an agreement and um, they're going to be paying money to journalists in some way. I wanna point out that one of the problems that people had with this scenario was basically that they complained that in Australia, a lot of the journalists were complaining that the money was going to go to News Corp and Rupert Murdoch and which was like basically a conglomerate news corporation and not to small local journalists or whoever else was being put out of business by these platforms or they saw themselves as being put out of business by these platforms. So, um, so it kind of is a very like story of like power meeting power type of thing. And so I was, before we were talking, I was saying that I was talking to my mentor, um, uh, Jack Balkin um, at Yale Law School about this on Wednesday. And Jack was like completely agreed with my summary of events that happened. And I was like, yeah, so you have Jack's free speech triangle, which on each corner of the free speech triangle, you have like platforms are up here, government is here and citizens or end users are in the other corner. And I was like, and so what you have happening in Australia is like a slow collapse of like platforms, like power meeting power, like end platform and like the end users and citizens being cut off. And my takeaway from this was like, well, at least finally people are seeing that before their very eyes happen and they can't be in denial about the specifics of it. And it can't be a story of let's, empower government to regulate the platforms or let's empower the platforms to push back against government that they have to see that these are two powers colluding and like that has to happen and i saw it as like a valuable lesson in that regard and jack took away from it that it was just horrible that this was happening and that this was like a net bad and that like this was just terrible um and so can you explain both the collusion can you explain why why you see it as collusion i think i'm missing that Oh yeah, well, it was just that like, it was just that the government of Australia like met with lobbyists and people from like, so maybe collusion is not quite the right word because it's not collusion like as you use it in like an like anti-monopoly sense, right? It's like, it was just kind of like they were the government and Facebook and the government and Google had multiple, multiple meetings to kind of change the bill before it was in its final form and to determine how they were going to kind of articulate various pressures. And so that's kind of what I meant. Does that make sense, Jane? 
Yeah, I just, I, I see, I mean, I understand what you're talking about when, when it comes to Google. With Facebook, I see this as one of the rare examples of there being an actual fight rather than, you know, this is the, the course that is the exact opposite of, of collusion in that colloquial sense, where Facebook said, you don't understand the implications of what you're about to legislate. We are going to make a business decision that makes sense for us to, to sort of show, you know, to show, <laughs> to show yeah, our power. Um, oh, no, I completely agree with it. It's just okay. that it didn't last. And they eventually did go to the table and meet with them in that week, basically. That's like- so That's the part that's really disappointing to you? Yes, a little bit. I mean, and, and even, and, to, and also that some of, so you will see, and like part of the history that we've all written about is like the story of Google standing up to like Thailand's like attempts at, uh, at like regime of like taking down like disparagement of the king in some way, like globally, right? And then extraterritorial kind of takedown. And you see, Google fighting on right to be forgotten. And you see, so you're right, Google has like traditionally kind of fought these things and Facebook hasn't, but then, and I don't, this is a, it's a super complicated case and the ECJ's ruling is like all over the place, but the most recent case of the Austrian, Austrian political figure that was defamed on Facebook and it was ordered as being taken down, unclear whether it is or not, but Facebook fought that very strongly in the ECJ. And that was actually something that I was very surprised to see because they have rolled over on a lot of these things. Um, and then you see Google roll over in some way on this Australian thing. And so it seemed like a role reversal. And it also was like, and I also just think that like, there's just such an imperfect history of like people, you know, in people's memories of like the moments that some of these platforms have fought against kind of censoring regimes or extraterritorial, extraterritorial types of jurisdiction. And then here, it was like not clear to me that there was any right answer. Some people who really knew thought that what Google had done was by far the worst thing in Australia. And some people were like, why couldn't Facebook have just done what Google did? <laughs> and you're just like, what the? <laughs> so like, I just am like, I am like, so there, I mean, I guess that is just, it's just such a rich, rich, like kind of example in my mind. I don't, yeah. I, like, and I do, do think that it pulls out a lot of interesting power imbalances. Well, it does. And, you know, you said that this one thing that this case study or example does, is it it pulls out and seems to confirm everyone's fears, even though we have all different fears. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's like kind of what I was saying. Like, it was like me and Jack who agree on like almost everything in a lot of ways. And we're just so, like, wait. <laughs> so, so I would love to know, like Andrew, what, what did you make of this, uh, of this issue? And, and who, who, who comes out looking good and who comes out looking bad? Yeah, I, I guess um, it, there's so much to unpack. I mean, first, I just want to say, I think it's a, it is a great example of where we are today. I mean, if you pick one thing that happened recently that sort of captures the mess we're in, um, mess, when I say we're in, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the mess of trying to figure out what are the right rules of the road for a global communication system, a global, you know, um, digital product, that, that is meant to be global, but also has to comply with different rules all over the place. So in this little instance, you know, it's, it pops up on the news and people talk about it for a week and then maybe it goes away. Um, and then, then there's a new thing that flares up. But this little instance shows us that, that you know, debates that have been going back for 40 years about state power versus um, corporate power, and in particular tech corporate power, which maybe is a new, especially powerful form of corporate power. Um, and, and that, you know, the head to head clash when, the, when one state and one super powerful company go head to head, it's like, um, you know, get your popcorn. Um, it's also, it also implicates the speech ecosystem. So like conversations about like, you know, in which of course we talk about in the lead up to the election, you know, sh are we, should we be happy with, or are we okay with the, dis the, the major decision makers? Um, as, as Kate put it in her great article, the new, the new regulators of our speech ecosystems being um, private corporations. Um, there's this 
added piece of global regulatory arbitrage. So maybe the companies are trying to play a game of satisfying the regulators to a certain extent in one place, but without setting any precedents that would change or complicate their relationship to regulators in a different place. Um, and then there's consumers that like all of us who read about the news and have very strong feelings about um, the power of platforms over our lives. And that that power, that, that those, those biases and those feelings, these are like very emotional issues for all of us. Um, a friend of mine says like, you, you, you either, you love your iPhone and so you feel a certain way about everything Apple does, or you hate your um, smart TV device. And so you feel a certain way about everything that company does. But like, we, these, are not, these are not issues about which we can sort of approach them coldly and rationally. We are living in the middle of it. And so, um, so I don't know if that helps, but I just, I just see this as like a nice example of all of the potential issues and we could talk about any one of them. Um, I will just say, you know, given what I've written, it's no surprise to me that at the end of the day, when the state and the company butt, butt heads, um, you know, no matter how much backroom dealing there is and the company, in lots of ways, the company's gonna win and make lots of money. But um, I think, the, I think this, you know, the state's ability to control the network and, and accomplish what they want is, um, is not to be taken lightly. Mm. Yeah, I, I think Australia, the Australian government comes out looking really bad. So I'm, I'm so for a few reasons. One is that the policy itself, I mean, just take away even the fight between Facebook and, and Australia, the policy itself is irrational or requires some very naive belief about how this business works. So it's like, okay, so so the viewers don't pay the websites. And I, we all understand the horrible vacuum there is in journalism right now. And so the government, it, so it's understandable that the government wants to find some way to get uh, streams of revenue to journalists, big and small, right? But by having Facebook do it, which is and knowing that Facebook is a free service that makes its money on the back of behavioral advertising, you're, you're basically insisting that Facebook do more of what people already hate about Facebook, which is like monetizing the attention, right? And so I like, this is like why I really, I was like so excited about talking to you guys. I was like, oh, someone's gonna get how completely absurd, absurdist, like ad, whatever the phrase is in Latin, but uh, stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yes, um, and so, and, and so I was happy. I was quite happy to see Facebook fight this fight. It's one worth fighting. Uh, I didn't, I did not realize that they had capitulated, Kate. So obviously my information is <laughs> out of time. Oh yeah, news links so, are back uh, up in Australia. So um, it, and it kind of reminded me of the, was it, was it called FOSTA and SESTA? It was like the original mm -hmm. section 230 attempt when Google and many other big tech firms, powerful firms went blank, went black for a day or an hour, or I don't know. But it was just to show the consequences of the, um, you know, in a sort of, well, in an exaggerated form, the consequences of bad regulation. And I think, you know, that you, you can believe that Facebook should be regulated more and still see this as a terrible regulation. <laughs> so to Jane, that you, point, you're... go ahead. Oh, sorry, please, please, Kate. Oh, I was just going to say to that point, to your point, Jane, about like how this is the model of this regulation is just on its face bad is like I was comparing it with um, uh, I was actually I was talking to I sent it to Nick Souser, who is a um, law and tech uh, professor uh, in Australia, and we were discussing it and he was like, the law is terrible. And I was like, OK, so it's not just me. And he was like, no, it's really bad. And I was thinking of it actually kind of, I don't think this is a perfect analogy for all of what Facebook is, but in this particular instance, I think it's perfect. The Facebook is the newsstand and you have all of these, like they're putting out all of these different magazines and all these different links to magazines or like whatever it is. And your answer for the magazines going belly up is, is to attack the newsstand. <laughs> doesn't make any effing sense like, <laughs> like at all. Like it just doesn't. Like that's not who, where the taxes should lie. It's like, 
you should increase the price of like of the magazines well, or you should or something right like there should well, be the other law, types of mechanisms the law makes sense if you think of facebook as being a money tree and it's just like i hate big you just you pay you know not, but what that I, is yeah. yeah oh that's but a that's, great but but that's not I, I have to say you two both described you know rationally using your words and your special powers <laughs> of reason why this is a stupid law but that's not what's going on, right? I mean, I, I actually, I think an interesting question, first of all, I think it's not a surprise, right? It is not a surprise that the government would stand up to Facebook. That seems like a winnable fight, especially if they think they could get them to comply because whoever leads that charge gets to say, I made them kiss the knee, kiss, bend the knee and kiss the ring. It'd be even funnier if they kissed the knee. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's just not a surprise. And in fact, I think there's a real puzzle here. And this speaks to, um, you know, the power of the platforms that's kind of hard to capture. But why don't governments around the world, not the United States government so much, but governments around the world that feel like tech companies almost entirely, which are almost entirely foreign, they come to our country, they make a lot of money off of our citizens' backs, they don't pay taxes, they don't comply with lots of law enforcement requests, they're generally, you know, flying around in private jets and being jerks and making gobs of money. Um, and, and by the way, like lots of people are getting riled up about them and it's politically savvy to try to take, take them on. Why haven't more states been more aggressive in directly confronting the tech companies? And I, I, the answer, whatever your explanation for the answer is, I think that gets at the power that, that these tech platforms have, right? Yeah, I mean, I have thought for a long time that if Google had decided instead of litigating the right to be forgotten that they had if they had taken the football and walked away from the EU if they had cut off all of their services and I mean all of them like not just search like all of their services do, who do I think would win a fight between Google and the EU I think Google like I think that yeah. people whose lives would collapse there would be no like their entire economy is built on like on that one on like that one company and so like they don't want to do google doesn't want to do that because it does pull like it does kind of expose exactly how much power they have and maybe kind of like create this like mass panic a little bit uh but i do think uh i do think that that's something that like this moment is kind of that's why I'm positive about this moment, I guess, is because I just do think that finally we're kind of seeing exactly what you said, Andrew, which is like why the, and to your point though, I think that it's very strongly that there's like a, the, it's like a, an inverse of the Brussels effect. Like if you don't have the Brussels effect or to do anything, you're just gonna get turned off by these platforms and they're not gonna comply. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen this for like the last, 15 years with um with various you know pakistan keeps trying to like kind of legislate certain types of content moderation so facebook won't comply and so pakistan turns off facebook until it turns it back on and so that's just kind of like you know and so that's kind of i think that that's you know and like just pakistan just isn't it's a it's a big market so is the eu but like none of them like this is kind of why these are just more powerful than any one one government and it just kind of seems like the world is finally realizing that like there's just been this regulate it regulate it regulate it i'm like who like who and what like where and like but, what's but, going on but i think one important thing and so i somewhat object to the use of the word power i i know what you mean and it's possible that the three of us will have different opinions about this but when i hear the word power i it think means, that, it means being able to make someone kiss your knee yeah the how <laughs> the how matters um, enforcement. It's all about me. enforcement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jane got the joke. Uh, Took her second. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so if there, if you're exploiting some, like when you're exploiting some kind of force that is not the collection of individual decisions that people are voluntarily making, that I think we can all safely agree is power. But if Google wields Okay, power, I can't think of a better word. If Google wields <laughs> influence, <laughs> if Google wields influence because people, individuals, prefer its services over other things that are free or cheap, I, I, I just, I, I want, you know, I want a different word for that term because I don't think this is like, you know, it, it's not the same as 
a mega state that has a more powerful army. Um, the reason the reason regulators have trouble is that, and we can even go back to like before the GDPR, when there was when poor, you know, when the Europe when Europe was dealing with the data protection directive, they had to kind of just pretend that Facebook didn't violate it, right? And because the alternative was finding Facebook to be illegal and no one wants that. And so, so I, I think the problem with regulating is, is actually harder than just um, these companies being sort of rich and having good lobbyists. It is, or, or you know, having, or having technologies that are bottlenecks, although maybe, maybe there's some of that too. I think it's also just genuinely that people, as much as they hate tech, they also, they also want it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's that has to be part of the story, right? So in Brazil, Brazil is one of the biggest markets for WhatsApp. Everyone in Brazil uses WhatsApp for everything. It's you know the it's an essential communications method. And when a judge ordered WhatsApp be shut down for a period of hours, um, and Facebook said, you know, it was because Facebook wasn't complying with a law enforcement request, which by the way was otherwise valid within Brazil. They someone showed up with a warrant and said, "Give us this stuff." And Facebook said no, and a judge said, "Okay, goodbye, WhatsApp." And they, you know, pushed the big button. And um, and who went crazy? Brazilians in the streets, you know, demanding that WhatsApp be brought back online. So it didn't take a lot of smoke-filled lobby lobbyists. Um, the room, the rooms are smoke-filled, not the lobbyists. Um, but no, you know. I think that yeah, I think that that's exactly. But isn't that? But isn't that a? Isn't that if? If regulating or trying, if the state trying to regulate your commodity or your product, uh -huh. like and mobilizes individual citizens against the state, isn't that power? <laughs> like, I think that that's a really strong, that's like, it's not how you traditionally think of it, but it's like, it is, it is its own enforcement mechanism, Jane. Like they're not coming in and like doing something like they're just being like, listen, if you, and I, I want, I like, I have a paper that I'm going to finally finish with Elizabeth Pullman soon. Um, that's about the Dutch East India company and, mm -hmm. and these tech companies, which actually makes this argument that it's like this commodity and like, it's like this in scale. And also that they brought these, that like the Dutch East India company brought these regulatory regimes to, to like all of these different places that it mm -hmm. also offered its product and it had power and that like, there wasn't any pushback on their governance regimes because people right. wanted their products so badly. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a nice fit, but here's the one key difference is that the Dutch East India Company and all of its kind of like the progeny that were similar to it all operated with charters from the state yeah. that like they were had this permission to go out and do it. And like they tithed to back to the state in some way. And I think here, what you have is like the reverse, the market allowed this to happen absent any state permission or regulation and states are pissed because they've seen this huge amount of power kind of accumulate without their say so and they want to claw it back specifically it's happened mostly from american companies right. and so it has like i think that like that's kind of one of the reasons the eu finally got like its shit together and tried to start regulating is because they want it or, or have been have been for a while trying to kind of claw this back or to, yeah. to like get a piece of the pie. I don't know if claw it back is like the right word, but that's kind of um, kind of how I was thinking about it. Yeah, yeah and breaking, br building a customer base um, who will defend you when you've been accused of breaking the law, that, that's Uber's business model, right? U Uber went lots and lots of places. And I think their lobbying team was unbelievably savvy at basically rolling out in places where it was very clear it was illegal. Um, which is much, much less of a gray zone than, than Facebook, where they just said, get this in people's hands. They want it so badly that they will demand that it be allowed. And that basically happened. You know, there were a few places where the taxi lobby was really strong and managed to curtail it. But overwhelmingly, that product went, went around the world, even though it was inconsistent with existing rules because customers demanded it. Well, because taxis are also like the worst system we've ever created. <laughs> like you have to be standing somewhere where they can see you. You have yeah. to be waving your arm in the right way. And if it happens yeah. to be raining, you're never going to get one. And so it's yeah. like, they're not a particularly efficient, like yeah, they're you, not an, you, like this is a much, it's a very, it's a much superior service in a lot of ways. 
Well, so that, that raises a difference. So I think the Uber example is different from the Brazil example. The Brazil example actually might be an example of what I'm, what I too am willing to call power. The Brazil example <laughs> is that there are these network effects. And so if you turn off this, this one communication system that everyone is already using, they can't just go to the next alter, alternate. They don't, there's a coordination problem. It's not clear what, what the next alternate is. They haven't been yeah. using it, you know. Whereas with Uber and what, what Uber did was it just so outperformed what everyone knows what the next alternate is, but Uber just so vastly outperformed them. And I think this is similar to many of Google's products as well, that it's, there's not actually a stickiness inherent to the product. It's just that they uh, did it so well for a while. And, you know, we can, I know that there are anti-competitive allegations and whatnot, but but at least for a while, I think the story was um, Gmail is so much better than the other email clients that it's hard to give that up. And then on top of it, it's free. And so, um, so I don't know. I think there's a difference there. I see we have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, but uh, Jane, you guys, let's write a paper about all the different types of power that private platform, I mean, like it would actually be a good paper, but like yeah. seriously, network effects. Kind of like all of, but like I think you're, I think you're on this. I think the convenience, like friction, like all of the things that build power in the product, and it's you're right. It's not one to one across all of them, but starting to make sure that people understand the essential differences there as they decide to try to regulate them or yeah. break them up or do something would be I, I so much more. Some some deserve regulatory skepticism, you know, deserve concern and skepticism more than others. Yes. yes. Okay. I, right. Jana, before before we turn to the Q and A, which I want to turn to, we're going to. Um, but I, but selfishly, I have one more question that is hanging in the air. I think based on Kate's comment that these are mostly American companies, I, I think that's that's a dynamic that needs to be addressed. Like that is, it is true. Every year, I, I when I when I discuss you know my work on cross border law enforcement requests, I, I go back and check again. Like, what are the most the ten most popular web services in Brazil and India and you know basically every country except China, and it's invariably seven, eight, or nine out of the ten most popular websites and web services are American. That that is that is kind of amazing. I mean, we are talking about everyone around the world is, has shifted, just like we have, especially this last year, into living a digital life. But when they shift into a digital life from Sao Paulo, they're shifting into an American corporate vision of that digital life. Now, it might be in Portuguese, it might have lots of local flavor, but the state's tension with that new digital entity is, just, is, a, is very much about um, the fact that the entities are all American. And the, the Snowden revelations, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff that makes this very much not just Brazil against a company, but Brazil against an American set of companies. Is that right? And if it changed, if it turned out that suddenly Brazil was using lots of Chinese apps and not American apps, that the debate might look different? Do you guys what agree do you with think, that? Jane? Um, I agree with all of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, isn't this also like, isn't the real threat that like, and you, I, I don't, I'm not threat. I don't know. I see that the real, and I think that there was a while that this was very much in question, but Tim Wu and Jack Goldsmith's early 2000 prediction and who controls the internet of like the world essentially becoming balkanized into nation states trying to control or have control of various parts of the internet. And I remember in like 2015 talking to Jack about this and he was like, I was so wrong about that. Who knew? And then like a year later, like, oh, everything had shifted in terms of what, <laughs> and he was like, never mind. <laughs> oh, <that's> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, but I mean, that well, was, I mean, yeah. So I do think that there's sort of two, two issues that are wrapped into there. What, one is, you know, once, you know, given that basically the US and China are the two exporters of tech, um, how should any government that's not them res respond and how can they get their values and priorities sort of embedded? But the other question is why it's just those two companies. And so there, I mean, I, I think one, you know, what one reason I don't want American tech policy to change too much is that you know, all, all things equal, U.S. values are probably, you know, oh, be better than maybe some of the alternatives. 
And we are, and we benefit tremendously from not just the products and services, but the tax base too, of having these companies emerge here. And, um, and I think regulation is not the only explanation, but it is part of the explanation. Um, and so another thing these, that, that countries that aren't the US and China should be, should be doing, and I think you know, are, is probably trying to figure out how to uh, uh, you know, attract talent, attract, you know, compete on innovation. So Jane, uh, based on what you just said, and Kate, I would really love your thoughts on this. Do you think there's a tension between um, a, a tension that maybe China doesn't have between um, some of our commitments around values, like our First Amendment, and our attempts to create a secure cyberspace? I mean, the, the question is not, is the First Amendment a problem really for the state to secure cyberspace? That seems like obviously the case, but it doesn't that put us at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries? I mean, if you, I mean, hmm, I mean, if what you think is most important is security, I guess, like if you, if that's, if that, I mean, if that's going to be the, the like the point of competition, then yes, China will win. I mean, in the same sense, like one of the things I think that Jane brings up a perfect point, which is like the regulatory environment of the US created all these companies, not just the regulatory environment, also like our culture, also like a lot of other things, our immigration policies, there's like tons of reasons. I really think I feel incredibly strongly about that. Not, it was not all like the genius of section 230 by in a million, like for a million reasons why, but it didn't hurt that section 230 was there. Um, but uh, you have the exact opposite, like of like a totalitarian state kind of like coming in and being like, you will develop these pol like these companies for us and these products for us. And that also seemed to work, right? And so like, and then you have everything in between. And like, I think that that's like a really fascinating point. And that does get into like foreshadow kind of like, uh, like the battle royale to come potentially of like fear states versus free states kind of competing ultimately through these products. Um, well, the pandemic is an interesting, so it's not security versus, you know, freedom. It's, but it, it, it's public health versus freedom. And I think there is, you know, what we've seen with the COVID response too, how not only the, the tech uses, but, you know, just um, regulation in general is there are advantage, there can be advantages that are disadvantages most of the time, but once you're facing a pandemic, it's, it's, it's not, it's sometimes nice to live in a totalitarian state, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's totally true. I a year ago today, I was showing my students that video that was circulating of the drone in China going around and screaming at people to get back inside yeah. their houses during quarantine. Do you guys remember when this was yep. going viral and everyone was like, and now it's like, they don't have the coronavirus anymore. And I'm sitting here on Zoom talking to you guys. And like, yeah. I am both happy for that and uh, a little bit depressed about that. And like, you know, I don't know that I would do anything any different, but it's like certainly the trade-off. Uh, can I ask you guys a quick question? Yeah. Um, which is, um, I've been thinking a lot about how we talk a lot about speech on these platforms and everything we've talked about it today and products. But what about like the, do you think that there's any purchase to expanding the notion of assembly now that like and freedom of assembly and the value in assembly and community that, that these that these platforms provide? Like ju not just like moments like this where we can all get together and people can be part of this community and watch us as if we were talking like in a, an auditorium at, in Arizona. But like, you know, the idea that there is like, I go on Twitter every night and like, for like an hour and like make jokes with people that are like my colleagues and post about my tomatoes and get responses from like people I've never met about my tomatoes and like it's great and it's most of my socialization over the last year I'm not kidding mm -hmm. like I yeah. have been completely isolated I you know in a rural community for 11 months and I just came back to Brooklyn um and so I just I really it strikes me as like a very essential function I mean, obviously we've collapsed the idea of like a little bit of internet exceptionalism since the pandemic, but I'm just curious whether you think it's worth exploring the particular notion of assembly um, at all. Well, I, I'm writing, I don't know if the, this might have significant overlap or maybe only a little, it depends on what part of assembly you're interested in, but 
But I'm working right now on a piece about radical freedom of association, like thinking about social media, the social part of social media and how it's changed, um, you know, how persistent connection to friends is actually somewhat new because during the industrial era, people's longtime friendships were sort of broken apart as people moved to cities and had to work with other people, you know, that sort of thing. But now you can keep persistent communication. And I actually find it in many ways, my, you know, my, my co-authors and I find that in many ways it's valuable to have that, but in some, in, in like political epistemic senses, it, it, it can be very bad, very distorting. So we're sort of looking at the negative side. <laughs> Maybe you need yeah. to follow up and talk about the positive side. <laughs> no, I think it could be totally distorting. I haven't, I mean, I think that there's also that. I'm just really, I love that you're writing that. That's great. Like, fan, I would love to see a draft if you're, yeah. when you guys are really to share something, but that's a great idea. I totally think that that's, I just kind of was thinking about like the things that we've defaulted to speech and to, ver and to certain market, com like speech and market and security conversations. And there hasn't been like, like a rigorous analysis in my estimation of like association and assembly and other types of things that we talk about all the time in the law and that are not super well explored in the law in my opinion too um and 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 so like i just kind of thought that, that was interesting absolutely i agree i'm with you i'll send you a draft <laughs> great my thoughts of assembly uh when i hear the word assembly i just think about middle school and think <laughs> uh, assembly was such a drag <laughs> <laughs> um, should we take uh, some, some so just look at the Q&A for a minute? Um, so one of our Tech Law fellows, Vinny Yesways, has asked, um, I think this is directly at you, Kate. Um, you mentioned raising the price of magazines. Are paywalls an answer to Facebook Australia? Um, is the answer for the magazines to raise their advertising rates? You know, take, what's, is there a market solution to this problem? Um, I do think that we're in a period of awe uh, all of the models of journalism having been disrupted, I think that's pretty like that's pretty like non-disputed, right? And so maybe it's a question of it will settle out. But what seems really obvious to me is that there needs to be more of a safety net um, of some kind uh, because it doesn't seem to me as if necessarily the market is going to stable itself, stabilize itself fast enough for how the public good that journalism produces. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, I'm not saying cut the market out of it. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. I just think that there are in these moments of kind of transition, there should be incubation, like there should be some types of funds for incubation. Um, Taylor Owen um, at McGill and Emily Bell at Columbia Journalism School have written about various models of civic funds that kind of can be created to go to like local journalist organizations that um, that like that maybe platforms pay into, I think that would be a much more effective solution than what Australia proposed, for instance. Yeah. Like that would keep it right out of the hands of like Rupert Murdoch and the richest kind of more moneyed organizations and really encourage um, kind of citizen journalism and other kinds of small journalism. So it's not just like letting the market solve it. It's like letting the market solve it, but not quashing like everything that we need and want from good journalism while that figures itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, yeah I think I, the, the model for getting there is tricky, especially when we're in a situation of rampant distrust because it's like, okay, public goods, the, the classic solution is government support. So something like, you know, the BBC <laughs> model, right? But when half the country thinks that yeah, that 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 is a not a credible source of information. It uh, you know, so it starts to be a little more difficult. But like, also, like, I don't know why we'd have to like rip up everything and start yeah. over. Like, you yeah. know, it doesn't make any sense. There's plenty of models that still are providing, like, and plenty of journal journalism organizations. I don't want to throw out with the bathwater. Right. Um, yeah. And some really interesting new ones emerging, like Substack, which frankly is like a personal branding journalism and an opinion branding journalism and not an investigatory news journalism and I think it's like but maybe that's what some people want and like there's a market for that and maybe there will be other types of markets that develop but in the meantime we have to make sure that like you know there are some type it would be great if we could plan ahead so that the next time there's some type of new technology that is certainly ahead of, ahead for us 
that there is something to kind of like pick up the institution of journalism a little bit. Yeah. Right. And, and there and there will be hopefully new forms of storytelling, right? Like I mean, the markup is an example of this. Any any of you watching who don't currently subscribe? It's their one year and, anniversary yesterday. Yeah. yeah, and they are awesome, and they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff with data. So we live in a world of data, and it's really hard to tell stories around data. And they have data scientists and and visual artists trying to make, um, you know, the algorithms behind the machines we use come to life and try to understand and study them. And actually, um, if we had more time, we'd talk about some of the barriers to studying the use of platform algorithms um, that you know that the plat that the markup has been in engaged in. Yeah. Um, uh, th this is a really interesting question from Alexander Brooks. Do you believe the tech companies have the same level of power over the US government and regulators here, given that most of the companies get half their revenue and even more of their profits from the US and that they're mostly based in the US? What do you guys think? Well, 5% of like Facebook's users um, globally are, U are American. So it's a very small percentage of their of their of their base. That said, I don't know what the exact number is, but like a vast majority of their advertising revenue is from wealthy Americans, and that five percent of people that are on and like click through on like various links. Um, so it's not as if just mark pure market share is or pure pure user end user numbers are reflective of like the market share uh, globally. But I do think that. Um, I do think that there is, uh, there has been for quite some time, and I think it's kind of under, under discussed, um, like Facebook's been high, has been hiring lobbyists to be in DC for years and years and years. And like, and I think that there has been a push on their policies generally that they don't want to piss off the right or the left in order to kind of stave off any type of regulation. I don't know whether, I think that there is a certain sense that the first amendment prevents most meaningful regulation that's going to like really like impact their business model. And so they're a little bit protected. Um, and we can get into the fact that yeah, Facebook has started being a proponent of repealing section 230 in part because it would basically roll up the rug behind them on like protecting smaller companies that try to enter the market. And so, it, you know. So that, you know that's would, the point I was gonna make is that the real danger here is that <sighs> anger about Facebook just solidifies its power or you Google or whatnot, and, but mm -hmm. because they will for sure be able to comply. Whatever the new law is, <laughs> they, will, they will manage the compliance aspects and, and the smaller companies will not. And, and actually, we're, we're seeing some pretty good evidence that that's what even is happening with GDPR. GDPR doesn't even really fundamentally, sh you know, shock these systems as much as... And they get to meet, that don't they get to define, it? like, don't they, those right. huge companies get to define what that law means before, right. like, right. so, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think it's an interesting question, because I think... Um, not just the size difference, but the original question about the U.S. government's influence, because I think that part of the anxiety when when I've I've talked to you know regulators and governments around the world about tech companies, and there's it try there's lots of anxiety and stress and anger, right? And and it it's, it boils down to lots of different distinct concerns. But one concern is something like, you know, Brazil says we're an eighth or a 10th or, or maybe a quarter of their users and you know, increasingly re their revenue base. And yet we don't have anything close to the influence the US government has. Um, that's, that's not fair. So it's not just that we inherently ought to get this, but there's this kind of global competition among the states to have a say over how the internet ought to operate. And, they, and many governments feel like the US government has um, an unfair home court advantage just because of the culture and the location and all of, and the history of these firms being um, American. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an interesting question here at the um, at the in the, the Q and A that I think is related. Um, how can we make sure government will not use regulation or the threat of regulation for political advantage? Like take for example, <laughs> uh, small Sorry, question. Sorry, I'm like good yeah. luck with that. <laughs> yeah, you have you have I've eight been minutes. Doing that take with as much. Before tech. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So take, for example, the idea that Google or Facebook has, you know, could tweak their algorithm in a way that shifts an election. How do you regulate against that? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm not familiar with this particular study, but I, I worry a little bit about the um, some of the empirical claims for a couple of reasons. One is that sometimes studies that make a big splash, like do you remember the Facebook poke to vote study? Yep. Yep. Everyone was shocked by it, but when you actually look at the effect size, it's like really small. It's statistically significant, but it's extremely small. And, mm -hmm. and we and then likewise there are so many things that influence people's votes that we don't ask these questions about i mean take like traditional broadcast media i mean that probably you know whatever effect size effect you know influence google has i think um fox and cnn have have you know pr probably similar shares and influence and so, and then even if we assume, okay, it's a fact, there is some influence, um, <laughs> the, the, you know, you cannot regulate something that, that doesn't at some point have a, um, a you know, a, a vector or an, an inlet that can be exploited. And, and so generally in the past, we've been so, you know, this is like sort of, First Amendment, you know, Citizens United sort of theory that we've been so reluctant to contaminate that process um, <coughs> through regulation. Oops, sorry, the dogs. Um, that no regulation seems better than any, you know, cure. Um, but no, but I think that that's a, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Jane. Well, I, so that's the sort of standard. That, that's like probably how the Supreme Court would respond. <laughs> I'm curious if you think that's more or less correct or which parts of that might be worth challenging. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just kind of think that there is like, it's a little bit, there is the reality of what is going on. And then the, there is like this kind of like, kind of like creation of reality, not to be super dark and kind of postmodern about it, but like, you know, we came out of the 2016 election and the, the assumption was that like, that like Facebook had uh, handed it to Donald Trump and that we were going to fix like everything about like social media between then and now. Um, and I, I don't think we fixed much, like honestly, uh, and it, you know, and like, and yet, it, you know, and we, and we have a different outcome. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of things that happened, uh, but this is kind of what I mean. These are just like not, these are not controlled experiments. Like these are not, there's no way to kind of like say like kind of what the impact of various types of things are directly and not take into account that it was raining in Georgia, like on election day, uh, you know? And so like that, that, and like that, that's why people didn't go out and vote. And also they didn't get poked on Facebook. So that's like, that's like, but there's, I do think that, um, I do th generally think that the that the I am really hoping soon, and I think it is happening. If you just judge from like the 2018 Cambridge Analytica questioning of Mark Zuckerberg, and like which was literally like these these senators being like, "Mr. Zuckerberg, can you fix my email?" To like to like the level of questioning that's been happening in Congress, and I don't tend to give a ton of credit to like to to testimony in congress i do think it's a lot of showboating but like people are starting to get more sophisticated and they're starting to not be as interested in some like in bad in bad policies but there's always exceptions to that there's blackburn or holly or you know or like things like that which are like kind of these broad overbroad kind of regulations that they put up for, for political gain. And like, you just, I don't know, you have to kind of trust this imperfect process, hopefully to kind of, um, to, to work. And if not that, the courts. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Jane. So since, well, I, since, you, <laughs> since you raised the courts uh, right after talking about Congress, I suppose one, one interesting question that comes up in every conversation about regulating new technologies, right? It's like, who's the best situated regulator? Or are there certain kinds of questions that really should be in one you know, institution and handled there and not another? I, I, I have vacillated wildly between thinking courts are terrible to thinking courts are actually pretty good at this. Um, 
the general line among regulation of technology folks is that courts are terrible because they can't, they don't have expertise. They can't think about it, you know, the way that Congress could, but I mean, look at the alternative. The alternative is Congress, which as you say, that, that hearing was shockingly bad. Um, and, and there are lots of others that were yeah, as bad. Um, and courts at least are constrained by the case or controversy. So they develop rules incrementally and that has a real, you know, with, with new technologies, when we don't know where they're going, that has a real benefit, right? Yeah, you guys have feelings much. about the institutional capacity of one actor versus the other? I have to run, but I'm gonna oh, say that yes. I very much I very much agree with that. And I'm very sorry that I have to leave. This has been an absolutely amazing conversation. Thank you both. And I hope we can follow up an email afterwards. Um, but also amazing questions. Like those que these questions have been really great and um, in like pointing in all the right places. And so I'm just, it's very exciting. Like, I don't know, I, I hope that you guys feel this way. I feel this way. I do think it's getting better. I know that that does, it isn't like a popular um, isn't a popular view to have right now, but I really do think that people, that the public, the public, the general public knowledge about how these things are happening and where kind of all of these, these fights are shaking out and where like they're, what they're unhappy about. It's still very messy, but I do think that there is, there, we, there is kind of some consensus and some type of intel, like some, some cohesiveness coming to it very slowly, but surely. So I will leave you with that optimistic note. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Kate. Hey. Next time in person. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah. So um, Jane and I will stick around and there are a couple of really interesting questions still to um, unpack. So hey, can I respond there? to your last question? Yeah, please. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I mean, I, I think the courts have done a pretty good job, but the reason is is I think that they work under the shadow of the First Amendment mu with much, with much more of a sense of, you know, awe and threat than mm. any other regulator. I mean, the, I mean, I know, I know. So, so the in terms of um, administrative agencies, the Federal Trade Commission is usually the one that people think of for tech regulation. Right. I can tell you for sure that. They don't think much about the um, expanding, you know, sort of ambit of, of First Amendment protection because when they've, you know, when they've in, invited me to sort of educate them about it, they have not even heard of the case of IMS versus Sorrell. So, or at least, you know, the, the, at least the lawyers who happen to be in that room. Um, and, uh, and then the same is true with, with, with legislators, both state and to a lesser extent, uh, federal. Um, the other thing is that is the, the point that you just made, the incrementalism, which is really unpopular because normally we're supposed to want, you know, a lot of people want law to keep up with or anticipate technology. But in the instances where that has happened, I think about like the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act, for example, that, that yeah. you and I have been thinking about recently. This is a, this is a law that it, it had sort of mixed intent, but the practical outcome is that it, it basically bans facial recognition technology, but also even things like Shutterfly, figuring out whether two pictures are of the same person so that it can automatically organize your, your folders for you. And so, and this, you know, and so it, the, the implications of a well-meaning privacy law went way beyond the bounds of, you know, the kind of, the, the kind of, um, uh, concerns that, that animated the law in the first place. And so, so yeah, courts. Courts. Um, <laughs> interesting. That's so, yeah. And, and there's like, for those of you who are interested in this, there's a um, great debate between Oren Kerr and Dan Solov um, from maybe 10 years ago about this. And they stake out the essential positions on both sides. Um, Dan Solov is a fan of courts and Oren Kerr is a fan of legislators. And, um, and I, I think they capture the points that people are still talking about today. So it's worth oh, okay. um, pulling up. That. Yeah. So um, Kevin asked an interesting question here. Um, to me, the biggest tech issue of 2021 thus far isn't Australia and Facebook, but rather Twitter India. We know India is willing to block platforms by decree like they did with TikTok to allow domestic competitors to fill the space. How should companies like Twitter be squeezed in this fashion respond. Um, uh, there's a lot to unpack there and, um, and it's complicated for a bunch of reasons. So for example, um, India banned TikTok because China 
and India were involved in a military skirmish on India's northern border. So the so it's not th that you know that that um, there were lots of things happening there, including maybe potentially your cynical take that there was a handout to, to local industry. But the but TikTok was doing fine in India until the military skirmish and an Indian. Um, Indian government was under a lot of pressure to do something bold to say, we have some leverage over China, we're gonna hit them where it hurts, we're gonna shut down one of their biggest markets. Um, I'm not sure that's the same dynamic as what's happening with Twitter. Um, and you know, it's complicated, what's happening to Twitter is complicated, but, but it is worth noting that India in general has taken over the last five years, a much more aggressive stance towards foreign tech companies and that's motivated by lots of things. One of the things it's motivated by is the idea that, wait a minute, we're a huge country. We should have market power. We should allow our awesome startups from Bangalore to, to build their customer base here where they have a billion users, just like China does. And um, I think there's something to that. The other thing is they're completely fed up with American tech companies not complying with their laws. So they go to, they go to Twitter or Facebook and say, hey, take this content down. And the American tech companies for far too long responded to the Indian government by saying, basically, show up with a warrant from an American court, otherwise, you know, go, go fly a kite. So I think the American tech companies in lots of ways courted uh, this aggressive stance from the Indian government and don't really have a lot of sympathy for me in terms of, you know, crying now when the government um, lays the smack down on them. Interesting, um, they overplayed their hand. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, well, it's, yet, it's still to be seen how, how it's going to play out, but yeah. The, the part of the question, the, the cynical part of the question, I, I think, well, yes, cynical is, um, is perfectly valid, maybe not with this particular example, but I, I, I mean, there is an element of protectionism in a lot of different countries' responses to American technology. Uh, and there, you know, and so, so my, my, I think how you think about globalism and protectionism in general probably translates pretty well, maybe almost exactly onto to tech. And, you know, I, I think in general, people, you know, as, as, uh, as um, attractive as it might seem to give space for your own country's companies to do well, you're going to wind up it's short-sighted and it won't be good for, you know, the, the tech firms outside the country or the citizens inside the country, so. Yeah, yeah, and it's worth noting too, um, the, yeah, I mean, when, when GDPR was passed, this year, Europe did a lot of like chest beating and bragging about the, the development of, an, of strong privacy protections for Europeans, uh, you know, much of which is, is right and true, but, um, but also, um, you know, when Germany says data in these following categories must be stored in Germany by a German data controller, the winner is Deutsche Telekom, right? It's a German company that gets the, that gets the contract, that gets the benefit. Um, and actually, you know, Microsoft, which makes lots of money in Germany, has now a special guardianship or trust arrangement with Deutsche Telekom to store German Microsoft managed Azure cloud data. Um, which is basically a handout to the German industries um, in that, you know, so I, I think that's um, cynical, but, but right. Um, uh, Jane, there, there are two more questions here that have to do with speech. So um, one, so I'm going to, I'm going to say very little and let you answer them. Um, I'm going to work backwards. So Erwin says, in light of recent events on Twitter banning political figures, how do you foresee the future balance of rights of private companies like Facebook, Twitter, and the rights of private citizens using their service? Yeah. Um, well, you know, will free markets work or do we need regulation? And then there's this related question from Zach, uh, who says, one of the problems with the assembly question is that we live in cities with public land where so for example, you could go to the public park and have like a debate, right? Guys standing on the soapbox, you know, spreading his opinions in the public town square. But the internet isn't a public town square. It's private communications platforms. And right. um, this, these two questions relate. Yeah, so, so what do you think about that? Um, I am a bit torn. So let me first just describe 
the landscape of, of thinking among legal academics um, and, and, and the practicing bar as well. Uh, it itself is, is quite torn and, it, and you can't even map it onto like normal ideology, you know, left and right. Um, so, you know, both President Trump and Erwin Chemerinsky think that there should be a federal law requiring neutrality, basically creating a public square, even if it's held on private platforms. And when those yeah. two agree, you know that you cannot predict how someone feels about it based on their politics. Um, I, uh, I am inclined by instinct to agree with them that um, that large, well, for a couple of reasons. One, one is just that, you know, large, as a practical matter, the internet and, and social media in particular is the place where we can um, freely express ourselves. It's the closest we have to the digital public sphere. And so we should treat it as such. The other reason I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to, to agree with them is, um, is that there was until the Trump parlor controversy, there was so much public pressure and, and negative PR about Facebook and Twitter's failure to remove content that I'm not even sure that it's what the private organizations wanted to do, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think in anticipation of the types of regulation that may come up, Twitter and Facebook took a heavier hand. And so maybe we need public law just to let allow them to do what they would do what they would naturally do anyways if it weren't for this sense of um you know an, an anticipating um regulation okay so but now i'm going to switch sides because in my heart of hearts i actually think that a fractured um a fractured social media space where there's like facebook and twitter that has most of us almost everyone and then there are these much smaller parlor types of ecosystems that are um, siloed. Um, yes, it's true that those those people in those silos will not get as much diverse diversity of information as they would if they were in, if we had an inclusive community. But, but I am not sure that the diversity of information uh, for for some you know highly marginalized communities um, is actually doing any good and it might be doing harm and then switching for a second to look at how conversations are shaped for most of us the sort of majority of us that don't run that close to the line with Facebook rules it could be that our attention actually is sort of spent on things that actually are at the margins of true sort of political thought when we could be making progress you know problem solving progress if we actually let the marginalized groups be marginalized. <laughs> so that was a very complicated answer and it probably shows that I just, I, I have no idea what to think here. Well, it's ah, incredibly think? hard. It's an absolutely hard problem. And I, I sort of think whoever is making, I think speech issues are uniquely difficult. And I think whoever makes them is gonna take flack. So we, we, we happen to be in a circumstance because of our laws and, and, um, and history where the tech companies are making the decisions themselves about, about what kind of speech should, should stay up and what should come down. And they're getting demands from all kinds of people. As you say, people are clamoring to, to have them. Every day I see a new conference with a bunch of regulators and law professors. And, and one day the conference is about all the stuff they don't take down that they really should take down. And then the next day, there's a conference with a different set of folks who say all the stuff that's wrongly taken down that needs to stay up. So they're just getting hammered from every direction. And I'm not sure how much of this is the fact that they're private corporations. It might just be that anybody who makes these difficult decisions is going to get hammered. Um, I do think, um, and I never thought I would have said this, but I do think we're starting to get to a place where the platforms become it's just kind of odd when the signature law, you know, our speech, our signature speech law, the First Amendment, has nothing to say about these issues and actually gets in the way of the state trying to do something about them. So um, I think I think we are we are likely going to be in a place where we think that the most legitimate source of rules for the entire country is the state, and and that that means the state should say something about these content moderation rules, um, and that's going to mean that's going to as jane says that's going to be really liberating in a way for the tech companies who are just sick of 
part of the reason Facebook creates the oversight board is just to not have to make their, the decisions themselves. They wanna outsource it. And they, they're happy to have it be a private academics or it could be the government, but they don't wanna be responsible for these difficult decisions. They just slow them down and get in the way of the money they're making. <laughs> and oh. on that note, um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to stick around if you have anything to talk about, but I, I think many of the participants are either um, tech law fellows current or potentially in the future who have a really long day of Zoom. And so we could we could add a few minutes to the break. I personally have been on Zoom all day and I have peanut butter sandwich right here that I haven't had the time to eat. So if we end a few minutes early, I can scarf some lunch down before our next Tech Law Fellow interviews. I think that's a great idea. And I'm uh, trying, I tried to type an answer to one of the questions. So, okay. Oh, okay, great. Thank well, you, everyone. Lovely. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. It was lovely to, to, um, to read your questions and engage with you. And for those of you who um, either of us haven't met, we'll, we'll be probably chatting with you in the afternoon. Yes. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.